<laughs> Orphan, what do you think about the Roman Empire? The Roman Empire or the Holy Roman Empire? <laughs> The year is 955 AD, and Otto the Great just won his finest victory at the Battle of Lechfeld, where he turned back the encroaching Magyar menace. In doing so, he put an end not only to decades of raiding, but also to his foe's crowning attempt to carve out an alpine kingdom between Swabia and Bavaria. The news must have been received as a bitter disappointment in Constantinople where in the preceding years the Magyars had been instructed in the art and science of siegecraft by an imperial administration threatened by a newly ascended claimant to the legacy of ancient Rome. In the aftermath, the Byzantines could do nothing but watch from afar, as Otto was acclaimed Imperator by his troops in the ancient Roman mode. Just as they could do nothing when six and a half years later, Otto was formally granted the imperial dignity by Pope John XII. Today, we consider that occasion the precise moment when the so-called Holy Roman Empire was renewed. But to understand how Otto managed to go down in history as a second Charlemagne, we must first recount how his family came to power. It is only by relating the upheavals that took place following the extinction of the eastern branch of the Carolingian line that we can fathom how a Saxon came to rule over Franks. It was to be the peculiar misfortune of the Frankish people that just when their northern adversary faltered, another approached from the east. In 891 AD, the base-born Arnulf of East Francia, the great-great-grandson of Charlemagne, defeated a Viking raiding party at the Battle of the River Dill. Slowly but surely, the fury of the Northmen was tiring itself out. In that same decade, the Magyars established themselves in the former Imperial March of Pannonia. These were a Finno-Ugric people whose migration from the Volga to the Danube was spurred on by the westward advance of the Pechenegs and Bulgars. In the close of the 9th century, they came to the attention of both the Byzantines and the Franks, proving to be useful traders and mercenaries with a penchant for hit-and-run tactics such as only the Eastern Steppe can instill. Skilled in horsemanship and archery, the Magyars called their confederation On Ogur the Ten Arrows or Tribes, which is why the Franks came to refer to them as Hungarians. Unleashed in Moravia and Italy by Arnulf of East Francia, they became increasingly difficult to control after his death, following a stroke in 899 AD. Under the reign of Arnulf's son, Louis the Child, three East Frankish armies initiated and lost pitched battles against the Magyars causing a manpower shortage that resulted in 15 years of unchecked pillage and rapine. With the death of the 18-year-old Louis the Child in 911 AD, no more Carolingians, either legitimate or illegitimate, remained in East Francia. Though in West Francia another of Charlemagne's great-great-grandsons reigned, the situation was sufficiently dire in the East for the nobles to chart a new destiny for the realm. East Francia was subdivided into various stem duchies with tribal origins. These included Franconia, Swabia, Bavaria, Thuringia, and Saxony, whose rulers convened to elect one among them as king. They elected the Duke of Franconia, Conrad I. His dynasty, known as the Conradines, had played the game well, marrying into the Carolingian family, securing lands and connections in Thuringia, Saxony, and Lotharingia, and neutralizing their foremost rivals, the Bobenbergers. But all the same, Conrad's eight-year stint as King of East Francia was an unsuccessful one. For all his best efforts, he failed to prevent the adjoining region of Lotharingia from realigning itself with West Francia, and he even failed to get the nobles who elected him in line. The Dukes of East Francia now enjoyed a period of almost complete autonomy, indicating the role that self-interest played in their decision to instate an elective kingship. For his part, Conrad subordinated self-interest to the interests of the realm. As he lay dying, the childless king pleaded with his brother and heir, Eberhard, not to take up the crown and instead to elect another. Curiously, the primary chronicler of this period, Wittekind of Corvey, offers a typically Roman explanation for Conrad's decision. Though Conrad believed his family to have all the makings of royalty, 
he somehow got the notion in his head that they lacked fortuna et mores, meaning luck and a suitable character. The events that followed suggest an alternative explanation. The Conradines simply lacked subtlety. In 919 AD, the Dukes of East Francia assembled once again, and after a protracted period of wheeling and dealing, they finally elected Henry of Saxony, father to Otto the Great, and almost every bit as impressive as his more famous son. Though the Bavarians and Swabians seem to have been ominously absent, Henry won the support of his erstwhile rival, Eberhard, the new Duke of Franconia. The late King Conrad had gotten his wish, and a man capable of uniting the Saxons and Franks had been elected. Like the Conradines, Henry's family had played their hand well, marrying into the Carolingian family and gradually rising to preeminence in their Saxon homeland while extending their influence elsewhere. Nicknamed Henry the Fowler, the new king was an able hunter and military commander, and he was found fiddling with his birding nets when the crown was offered to him. In a stroke of political genius, he inaugurated his reign by refusing to be anointed with the kingly oils and referring to his vassals as friends so as to maintain the veneer of equality with them. Immediately following his election, Henry led his friends on campaign against the Swabians, whose duke surrendered in the face of overwhelming odds and was allowed to keep his lands and titles. Henry repeated this process in Bavaria, whose duke proved to be a more resolute opponent, even taking refuge among the Hungarians at one point to avoid bending the knee. All the same, he was also forced to become one of Henry's so-called friends. After three military interventions in Lotharingia, Henry established his control there too, and offered his daughter's hand in marriage to the duke who ruled it. By 928 AD, Henry was sufficiently secure in his position to undertake a winter offensive against the Wends, or West Slavs, which culminated in a great victory at the Battle of Lenzen. Yet his most famous victory came five years later, when he routed a force of Hungarians in the almost bloodless Battle of Riyat. In the lead up to the battle, Henry made all due preparations, pursuing a long-term defense and depth strategy that hinged on the construction and maintenance of earth, timber, and stone mortared fortresses located at choke points like river fords, mountain passes, and marshland roads. These alongside larger scale Fluchtburgen, meaning escape castles, basically refuges for local populations, farm animals, food stores, and equipment. From the time he became duke to the end of his reign as king, Henry erected as many as a hundred fortresses, only one of which took some two million man hours to build. As the traditional story has it, these forts were manned by the agrari milites, or farmer soldiers, who were responsible for taking up arms in defense of their communities. We can take this to be a pretty broad designation, owing to just how many forts had to be garrisoned. To buy himself the breathing room necessary to organize these Herculean defense measures, Henry concluded a truce with the Hungarians around 926 AD, agreeing to pay tribute to them for the next decade. But in 932 AD, Henry went back on his word, prematurely suspending for their tribute payments. We are told the decision was reached at an assembly, the justification being that it would be a misappropriation of church funds to continue enriching the Hungarians. It was a move that demonstrated the deft diplomatic hand of either Henry or his chronicler once again. The following year, the Hungarians took the field finding, to their disappointment, little support among the Wends who had once provided them with guides and safe passage, but now belonged to East Francia's sphere of influence. The Hungarians decided to divide their forces in two. One column ventured into Thuringia, where the local inhabitants escaped to the Fluchtburgen before amassing the numbers necessary to defeat the Hungarians in detail. The other column fared no better, confronted by Henry at Briad, near the fortification they were attempting to besiege. Realizing that they were caught between a hammer and an anvil, the Hungarians fled the scene before Henry's trap was sprung. After the battle, Henry turned his attention west to make more friends, meeting with the rulers of West Francia and Burgundy and solidifying his status as their senior ally. 
Henry's chronicler suggests that he was planning a trip to Rome next, but whether he intended to present himself in the Eternal City as pilgrim or imperial claimant is unknowable. That's because, during an ill-fated hunting excursion, Henry fell from his horse and seriously injured himself. The following year, Henry still had the wherewithal necessary to get his affairs in order, calling an assembly that confirmed his son, Otto, as heir to the East Frankish kingship. By the summer of that year, 936 AD, Henry was dead and the reign of Otto the Great commenced. The 23-year-old Otto had already cut his teeth campaigning against the Wends, and compared to his father, his coronation was accompanied by a good deal more fanfare and ceremony. He was crowned in Aachen, the former seat of Charlemagne's empire, where he was garbed in Frankish regalia and conferred with all the symbols of royal power, sword, scepter, and staff. Unlike his father, he readily accepted unction and all that it entailed. A few weeks earlier, a new king of West Francia had similarly been crowned and consecrated, and Otto was determined not to be outdone. The time for subtlety had passed. Otto's assumption of the East Francian crown set off a series of raids and rebellions lasting from 937 to 941 AD. Almost all at once, the Wends refused to pay tribute in the east, the Vikings reared their heads in the north, the Hungarians reappeared in the south, the Lotharingians fight for independence in the west, and in the very heart of Otto's realm, the noble families rebelled in collusion with his brothers. Each had their own goals and motivations, but all thought to take advantage of the accession of a new king. Otto's initial appointments and reprisals only fanned the flames of rebellion further, which the Hungarians and Danes took full advantage of. But one by one, Otto neutralized each of these threats. Though Bohemia succeeded in slipping out of his control, the other ones gradually fell back in line, and in the face of a vigorous defense effort, the Danish and Hungarian raiding parties melted away. The first Hungarian raid in almost five years ended in failure, and the withdrawal cost them the majority of their army, largely because of the defense measures undertaken by Otto's father, Henry. Yet the most serious threat of all was the rebellion that brought together the Saxons, Franconians, Bavarians, and Otto's own flesh and blood. The ensuing struggle saw many of the realm's great families split down the middle, with some joining the rebels and others siding with the crown. Otto had an older half-brother named Thankmar, the product of Henry's first union with a nun turned duchess turned nun again. The question of his legitimacy was an awkward one, and his unhappy fate was to be sealed when he took refuge from his enemies in a church, only to be impaled by a spear chucked through the window. Hostilities with the rebels resumed when Otto's younger, full brother Henry took up the struggle and pitched his own claim. The basis of his claim was that, unlike Otto, Henry had been born in the purple, meaning after their father had become king. He was encouraged in this Byzantine notion by his mother, who, between Otto and Henry, seems to have had a favorite. By 839 AD, Otto defeated the Bavarians but was still up against the Franconians, who were now joined by Lotharingia and West Francia. That same year, rebel and loyal forces met at the pivotal Battle of Andernach where the forces of Otto carried the day. In the aftermath, the late King Conrad's brother, Eberhard, lay dead, possibly at the hands of his own kinsmen who commanded the Loyalist army against him. The Duke of Lotharingia was also dead, having drowned in the Rhine while attempting to escape captivity. Meanwhile, Otto's brother, Henry, who had sustained a wound in a different battle, now lived in exile. The rebellion was over. It was probably the most serious uprising Otto's family faced throughout its century-long history. Yet, it is worth mentioning that, already, no other dynasties thought to claim the throne of East Francia for themselves, not even the Conradines. There was a kind of etiquette to this dance, which is why none of the highborn rebels were executed for their treasons. If the nobles survived the vicissitudes of war, then the worst thing that awaited them was exile and the forfeiture of their lands and titles. Unlike execution, title revocation was a royal prerogative that Otto exercised to the very hilt, deposing a whopping 27 vassals in total, more than any of the Carolingians ever had. By comparison, his father had deposed none at all. 
the balance of power was swinging away from the formerly semi-autonomous dukes and toward the Autonians and the church, the primary beneficiaries of this reallocation of wealth and land. That was the essence of Otto's centralization program, and it helps explain why he made the decision to forgive his brother, much of the approval of their mother. Even kings don't get to choose their family. After Otto secured Lotharingia, he entrusted the duchy to his penitent brother. Otto then directed his attention to West Francia, where he repaid the prior year's intervention in kind. His guiding policy throughout the course of his reign was to wisely preserve the balance of power there, siding with whichever faction happened to be weaker. West Francia's ancient inheritance made it difficult to do more than that. While old Roman roads made the transportation of armies and supplies swift and convenient, old Roman walls made sieges long and grueling. That is why Arnulf of Carinthia, Henry the Fowler, and Otto the Great all came to terms with having a western neighbor. After 946 AD, Otto was content to focus his efforts elsewhere, leaving further West Francian interventions to his son-in-law Conrad the Red, the newly enfeoffed Duke of Lotharingia. In the preceding years, Otto's brother Henry had failed to establish his rule in Lotharingia, forfeiting the duchy and then joining a plot to assassinate Otto in a moment of bitterness and frustration. It may well have been Conrad himself who caught wind of the scheme and tipped Otto off, but in any case, Henry was imprisoned and forced to perform penance in the manner of the last Carolingians. By 948 AD, their mother somehow succeeded in re-reconciling the two brothers, and this time, Henry was installed as Duke of Bavaria. Otto's brotherly mercy finally paid off, and Henry proved more successful in the East than he ever had in the West scoring two victories against the Hungarians and neatly supporting the king's forays into Bohemia. As you'll recall, this region had spiraled out of East Francia's orbit 14 years prior, but with an expeditionary force of Saxon and Bavarian levies, Otto compelled the Bohemians to surrender in the face of overwhelming odds. By 950 AD, Otto was home for Christmas at the palace of Memlebin, which his father had also been partial to. For the moment, Otto could kick his feet up and rest easy knowing he was the undisputed hegemon north of the Alps. Yet it was then that the opportunity to extend his hegemony to Italy presented itself in the form of a marriage prospect. Otto had already been married once to a granddaughter of Alfred the Great named Edith, thereby securing an alliance with the Saxon sister kingdom of Wessex. Yet after giving him two children, Edith had died four years earlier. Now, Western Europe's most eligible bachelor crossed the Alps and came to the rescue of a noblewoman named Adelaide, who was at once daughter, daughter-in-law, and widow to the last three Lombard kings. A Burgundian by birth and Italian by upbringing, the comely Adelaide came from the distinguished line of Welfs who had already produced one empress. Having refused to marry the next Lombard king's son, Adelaide was imprisoned by him before she made her escape four months later putting herself in the protection of Otto's brother Henry. She was then escorted by Henry to Pavia, where Otto took her hand in marriage and assumed the Iron Crown. By Lombard tradition, a widowed queen had the right to grant the royal dignity to a husband of her choosing. As for the imperial dignity, that was an honor to be conferred by the Pope ever since the days of Charlemagne. Receiving no invitation from the current occupant of St. Peter's throne, and with the deposed King of Lombardy hiding out in the Alps, Otto decided there was little else for him to do in Italy, at least for the moment. The following year, he returned to East Francia and left matters in Italy to his son-in-law Conrad the Red. Yet Conrad disappointed him, though he succeeded in rooting out the former Lombard king, Berengar II, from his hiding place in the Alps. The agreement he reached with him was not to Otto's liking. Ultimately, a new arrangement was imposed, whereby Berengar acknowledged Otto's suzerainty and gave up control of the highly strategic Brenner Pass to Duke Henry, which gave him control of the route to Italy. The latter provision was the problematic one. Already, there seems to have been some tension between Otto's brother Henry and his son by Edith, Ludolf. In the lead-up to Otto's invasion of Italy, Ludolf had preemptively attacked the Lombard king, but failed to make any inroads until the arrival of his father. There is some debate whether this was an action taken unilaterally, or with Otto's approval. Since assembling an army as large as the one Otto brought to Italy would take time and attract attention, it's not unreasonable to think that Ludolf acted in accordance with his father's wishes 
and that his motivations were reframed by subsequent events. After the king took Adelaide as his bride, Ludolf no doubt felt that his position as heir was in jeopardy, especially because of the important role that the young and intelligent queen steadily began to assume at court. Later chroniclers would call her Mother of the Realm, and in her lifetime she was designated Consors Regni, or Royal Consort, which denoted co-rulership, probably in recognition of the sway she had in Italy. In addition to that, there was the steadily accumulating influence of his uncle Henry, who now controlled an important route into Italy. That is why Ludolf hatched a scheme to which he recruited a number of different conspirators, among them the Archbishop of Mainz and his brother-in-law Conrad the Red. Their goal was not to kill, nor even to dethrone Otto, but instead to intercept him at Ingelheim and compel him to agree to their terms there, namely securing Ludolf's succession, reinstating Conrad's preeminence among the king's advisors, and lastly revoking Henry's duchy. As usual, word reached the king but because he changed course from Ingelheim to Mainz so as to secure the loyalty of its archbishop, the conspirators got word and managed to chase Otto down and force him to accept their terms. Only a few days later, the king slipped away to Dortmund, where on Easter Sunday, he publicly repudiated the arrangement he had been compelled to make. He then revoked each conspirator's titles and offices with the notable exception of his son. Hoping to reach some kind of agreement with him, Otto was nonetheless prepared to use force if necessary, besieging the city of Mainz in spite of the fact that its population of some 20 to 30,000 people was then a staggering sum. Though his siege was unsuccessful, it has been used as evidence in recent years to support the heterodox notion that Ottonian armies reached as many as 20 to 25,000 men, over twice the previously established upper bound limit. But regardless of the true size of his army, because it had been raised for five months now and was fighting for a war goal as dubious as this one, Otto had to disband his levies and shift his focus to Bavaria. There, with only his household troops and token support from the nobles, he conducted smaller scale operations against his brother's enemies. In spring of the following year, Otto had a more decisive campaign in mind against Bavaria and Swabia, when suddenly, the Hungarians reappeared, taking full advantage of the realm's moment of weakness once again. Because the rebels were accused of giving the Hungarians safe passage and supplies, the political landscape shifted entirely in favor of the king, and he soon brought an end to internal hostilities. Meanwhile, the Hungarians lay siege to Augsburg. Previously, their activities were limited to raids, which had proven increasingly ineffective. Having received technical knowledge and training from the Byzantines, this time the Hungarians came with siege weapons in tow. One of their leaders, Khan Bulksu, had even spent time in Constantinople, where he converted to Christianity, accepted the emperor as his godfather, and was named a Roman patrician. This policy has to be placed in its proper context, as part of the long-standing feud between the Byzantine Greeks and the Franks. A feud as old as Charlemagne's imperial coronation in 800 AD. Though Otto was not a descendant of Charlemagne, nor even a Frank, he had made his imperial aspirations known with his arrival in Italy four years earlier. Now, in 955 AD, the Hungarians encircling the former Roman fortress city of Augsburg on the river Lech threatened to bring an end to such aspirations. Taking the city would mean dislocating East Francia from Italy, much to the pleasure of the Byzantines who still held lands in the southern part of the peninsula. At the head of an army of Franconians, Bavarians, Swabians, and Bohemians, Otto marched to the relief of the city. The composition of his forces testified to the fact that the king was back in control, even if the Saxons had to remain in the north to defend against Wendish raids. Both sides numbered roughly 10,000 men, and the initial phase of the battle was a stalemate. After the Hungarians seized the initiative by lifting the siege and ambushing Otto's baggage train, they were counterattacked by mounted troops under the command of Conrad the Red who was eager to get back in the king's good graces. Otto then ordered a general assault, and according to popular legend, he charged the enemy on horseback, armed with the Holy Lance itself. Both sides sustained significant casualties, among them Conrad, whose epithet all the more grimly befitted him with an arrow lodged in his throat. Though no clear winner yet emerged, the Hungarians beat a well-ordered retreat, 
Yet it was then that the many defense measures undertaken by the Ottonians truly paid off. Every river, forest, swamp, or mountain path the Hungarians hoped to cross was defended by well-garrisoned fortifications comprised of local levies and professional soldiers. In addition to that, the summer was a particularly rainy one, making it impossible to ford any of Bavaria's rivers. Dividing themselves into small groups, each looking for a way home, the Hungarians were systematically defeated in detail, killed almost to a man. Their leaders were captured, dragged to Regensburg, and publicly hung. Wittekind of Corvey tells us that in the wake of his great victory, Otto was hailed as father of the fatherland, master of the world, and emperor by his triumphant countrymen. Yet because the Saxons were still embroiled in a struggle against the Wends, Otto had little time to rest on his laurels. That same year, he confronted them at the battle on the Rechnitz River, where he was victorious against a substantial force of Abadrites after dispatching a flying column to flank them. This required the construction of three bridges downstream of the enemy, who may have been distracted because of Otto's use of stone and spear-throwing weapons. In the aftermath, the two Abadrite commanders lay dead, one of them decapitated by an ordinary soldier whose fortunes changed overnight after he brought the head to Otto and was rewarded 20 mansi, or homesteads. Because of his victories at the Lech and Rechnitz, the belief that Otto was divinely favored took hold on both sides of the Alps. By 960 AD, the people of his realm prayed that God would give triumph to his servant, the emperor against his enemies. And that same year, the Pope formally requested his assistance against Berengar, who now threatened Rome itself. The time had come for Otto to play the part of Charlemagne as the protector of the papacy. Before he set off the following year, Otto wisely got his affairs in order. He had outlived Conrad the Red, his brother Henry, and his son Ludolf alike, all dead of battlefield wounds or illnesses. Two of the sons he had by Adelaide died, but a third, the six-year-old Otto, was named heir and co-ruler, and, like his father, he was crowned at the Palace of Aachen. After Otto crossed the Brenner Pass and arrived in Pavia, Berengar fled to the Alps, biding his time as he had done before. But Otto didn't plan on leaving so soon this time. On the 2nd of February, 962 AD, Otto was crowned emperor in old St. Peter's Basilica. There, he promised the Pope his protection and reconfirmed the donation of Pepin. In return, Otto received the imperial title and a number of holy relics. As per his request, Magdeburg was also elevated to an archbishopric, one of the last major modifications to the ecclesiastical framework that Charlemagne and the papacy had established in the early 9th century. Each of these papal grants aided the Ottonian Christianization program in the lands around the Elba, just as similar grants had once aided the Carolingian program in Saxony. Besides smoothing the integration of newly conquered peoples, these programs added to an emperor's gravitas. Holy relics effectively became the symbols of an imperial court that was by necessity presentational rather than representational. Put another way, an emperor's power waxed and waned in direct proportion to where he and his court happened to be located, so imperial icons were portable. That is why we see the holy lance wielded at Riyadh and Lechfeld, and a relic of the true cross unveiled during imperial perambulations through the realm, which Vassal swore fealty on. It was an imperial cross that Charles the Fat symbolically sent to Arnulf of Carinthia after the latter deposed him a bitter reminder of the oath he had forsaken. Yet the most famous symbol of Ottonian power was, without a doubt, the Karlskron, the so-called crown of Charlemagne which features in many of the late emperor's depictions, but was in actuality created either for the coronation of Otto the Great or his son and successor. This same crown remained in use until the very end of the Holy Roman Empire. The arch that closed this octagonal crown served to distinguish it from the open diadems reserved for royalty. Each plate is adorned with images of Christ and Old Testament kings like David and Solomon, a historical reality that proved problematic to the Nazis a millennium later, after their reappropriation of the crown in the wake of Anschluss. Today, the crown can be found in Vienna, 
with various replicas scattered throughout the former provinces of the Empire. The Imperial Regalia also included the newly encrossed Orb, or Reichsaffel. This orb gradually replaced the staff as a symbol of temporal rule. The crown and orb alike appeared on newly minted Ottonian coins, depicting an enthroned emperor frontally, a departure from the numismatic traditions of the Carolingian and ancient Roman emperors. Two-thirds of Charlemagne's empire now stood reunited under Otto, who came to be seen less as an imperial founder and more like a renewer of the empire established in either 800 AD or 27 BC. In his book, The Heart of Europe, A History of the Holy Roman Empire, Peter H. Wilson says that, quote, one 12th century chronicler compiled a list of 87 emperors since Augustus, suggesting that Charlemagne had succeeded to the original Roman Empire in 800, rather than merely reviving it. Translation, i.e. renewal ideology, became increasingly flexible as other authors presented the shifts from Rome to Constantinople, 4th century, to Charlemagne, 800, to his Carolingian successors in Italy, 843, and finally to the German king, 962, as merely a succession of glorious dynasties ruling the same empire. The papacy was obliged to endorse these arguments, since it wanted to preserve its role as agent in each translation of the imperial title. End quote. Nonetheless, Otto broke with the past and set a new precedent by associating the imperial dignity with the elective kingdom of East Francia, otherwise known as Germany. This had important implications, enabling the imperial title to fluidly pass from one dynasty to the next, so long as it enjoyed papal sanction. Even without it, each king of Germany after 962 AD was either an emperor or emperor-to-be. A pope could make and unmake emperors, but an emperor could also make and unmake popes. Otto demonstrated as much when he deposed the very pope who crowned him, John XII. Born Octavian before taking his papal name, he had been content to name another as Augustus. The litany of crimes he was charged with included murder, perjury, incest, simony, apostasy, paganism, and Satanism, though his real crime was breaking faith with the emperor and plotting against him. Deposition was the easy part, and John XII's immediate successor on the throne of St. Peter had a difficult time establishing himself in opposition to the two other constants of medieval Roman politics, the highborn clans and the lowborn mob. Setting the tone for the state of bosom enmity between medieval emperors and popes, Otto crossed and recrossed the Rubicon on several occasions to restore order in Rome. In 964, he besieged the Eternal City and built two sets of walls around it to prevent relief efforts, probably knowing full well that Caesar had done something similar in Elysia, due to the many copies of De Bello Gallico floating around Europe by this time. In 968, he besieged Rome again in his third Italian expedition, and his successors followed his example in their own bouts of Teutonic fury. During the twilight years of his reign, the Italian situation was sufficiently in hand that Otto could afford to return to his kingdom north of the Alps. There, he continued his administrative reforms and imperial perambulations, though increasingly his vassals came to him. At an assembly held in Quedlinburg in 973 AD, it was not just his vassals who attended, but also Greeks, Poles, Russians, Bohemians, Bulgarians, Italians, and even the newly Christianized Danes and Hungarians. Europe would not see another barbarian invasion on the scale of the Danish or Hungarian ones until the Mongols arrived hundreds of years later. In his book about the post-Carolingian period, Herbert Schutz writes, quote, Within less than a half century, Otto had departed from Carolingian models and had converted his inheritance of his father's tentative, more or less regional kingdom into an empire with international scope. He had turned his father's rudimentary personal associations into a governable realm, in which peace and quiet had been established, where outer and inner turmoil had been rampant only 40 years earlier. It was an astonishing array of accomplishments, the confirmation and elevation of the monarchy, the establishment of supportive secular and episcopal administrative structures, the attainment of the imperial crown for himself and for Adelaide, the reduction of Byzantine control over parts of Italy, the merger of the German and Italian realms, 
the elimination of the Hungarian threat, and the Christianization of the border Slavs through the creation of Eastern bishoprics, and the confirmation of the elected succession through primogeniture." End quote. Two things should be noted. The first is that Otto's inheritance also included a sophisticated defense system left behind by his father. And the second is that the matter of succession was smoothed by the fact that Otto only had one surviving son, now almost 18 years old. Though the succession of the kingdom, and by extension the empire, was nominally elective, the royal and imperial titles tended to be monopolized by a sequence of great dynasties, in this case the Ottonian one. In the same year he held his great assembly, the 60-year-old Otto died at the palace of Memleben, just as his father had. Following the emperor's death, his innards were removed, buried in Memleben, and his body was filled with spices and embalmed with oil before being transported to Magdeburg Cathedral to be buried beside his beloved first wife, Edith. Because of the adoring crowds drawn out to witness the funerary procession, the 80-mile journey took 30 days. Now, it remained to be seen how Otto II would capitalize on one of the smoothest imperial successions since that of Louis the Pious. Like the late Conrad, he was also called the Red, though purportedly for more troubling reasons. In the next episode in our epic series covering the entire history of the Holy Roman Empire, we will cover the rest of the Ottonian period, including the rich legacy they left behind. Though most people don't realize it, this family did more than virtually any other to make the Dark Ages less dark. Thanks as always for tuning in, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Your support means the world to me and it will keep this series chugging along with ever greater speed.